Hello, everybody. My name is Helen Oakley, and I'm security application security architect at SAP, and I'm a co-founder of Leading Cyber Ladies Toronto. And I have with me here Nitika Parkava, who is manager of cybersecurity, privacy, and financial crimes and PWC. And today we welcome you to our Leading Cyber Ladies Toronto session here. And we first of all wanna have, I wanna say a big thank you to CyberX, Cyber Exchange to host us today uh, with our special guest speaker. So I'll pass it over to Nitika. Nitika, please introduce a little bit more our chapter. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Helen. Well, welcome everybody to our April meetup. And then uh, this is our Cyber Ladies Toronto chapter. And as you can see, a couple of pictures uh, for the days when we could meet uh, in person. I so miss those days. Uh, and then here are a few pictures from our very first event and few brunches that we have done over, uh, over, over to Toronto during uh, uh, when, when things were normal. Going on to the next slide. Yes, uh, thank you, Nitika. And I definitely miss everybody and our in-person meetups. Um, I, I hope <laughs> eventually we'll go through, but today uh, we're still able to meet. Thank you to CyberX again. However, uh, it have, hasn't started in Toronto, just a little bit history. Uh, Leading Cyber Ladies organization started in Israel in 2015, and it's been um, founded, the movement has been founded by Karen Alazari and Hila Meller from Israel. And here are the pictures from different chapters. Today, we have chapter in Tel Aviv, in London, UK, in New York and Toronto, and we have, as ever more participation as um, it was before, regardless of um, the whole world situation today. Nitika? Yeah. And then uh, we are very happy to let everybody know that we are around 2,000 members globally and our chapters, as Helen had mentioned, are in Tel Aviv, London, Toronto, and New York City. And then it's super exciting to see that with every single event, we have 30% increase in number of members. Uh, so which basically tells us like how many women there are in cybersecurity and then they are looking for the networking opportunities like these. Uh, we do have monthly and quarterly events, and then we will be doing our events online until further notice. And I can't wait the world to be, get back to normal. Thank you. Um, and the mission statement is that we, would, we are inspiring women to follow their career in cybersecurity, to pursue their career, and to, um, to lead uh, in cybersecurity field. As we know, there's still underrepresentation of women in cyber. So we would like to provide this opportunity of through different events, experiences, workshops, uh, sessions like today, uh, opportunities for you to learn, to speak like our guest speaker today. And of course, um, our goal is to increase the cybersecurity and the representation, uh, women representation in, in this vibrant field. And then here I'm introducing all our uh, cyber ladies across the world. So Karen in Israel, Vidrut, then uh, next is Sivan in New York, Hila in Europe, uh, Bobby in London, and myself and Helen in Toronto. And then uh, follow us on uh, Twitter at Ladies Cyber. And just a few, uh, few more aspects about our Leading Cyber Ladies movement. Call for action, join the movement and be an ally, be supportive. Um, we have listed here six points uh, such as engagement, right? Engage with community, engage at the sessions and so on. Learn, learn from the sessions, from the workshops, lead and support, be a mentor, raise, uh, um, raise a hand or, or help somebody who is trying to make into the field. Speak at the events, don't be shy, you know, contact us if you would like to have more speaking skills, um, uh, practice more your skip <laughs> not skipping, speaking <laughs> skills. And uh, of course, partner with uh, different organizations such as CyberX uh, for further um, um, sharing the, the movement and increasing the uh, representation of women in cybersecurity. And of course, if you want to start the chapter in your location, your time zone right now, I think it's more like 
time zone rather than locations, uh, please get in touch with us and definitely we can um, follow up with you and see how we can initiate something else as well. And now to Nitika. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I, we would like to introduce Samira today. Yeah, sorry, I was just saying, uh, I would like to pre present uh, Samira, who is our guest speaker. She's a security researcher at East Entire. Uh, so Samira, welcome, and thank you for taking the time for the presentation today. Thank you, Samira. Thank you so, so much. much. Yeah. So, I, so at the end, just a little, um, little note to everybody. Um, please uh, put your questions in the chat. We are monitoring the chat. We're gonna talk to you in the chat. We're gonna do live Q&A at the end of the session. So don't be shy, uh, raise your questions there. And we'll talk to you soon. Samira, all yours. Okay. Um, hello and welcome to our session on browser sandboxes. Um, today I want to talk about browser sandboxes and the ways that attackers can find to escape from them. So why is this important? Um, people have trusted the browser sandboxes due to the restrictions that the browser apply on the access to the other resources on their computers. Although there are um, many uh, capabilities involved in this feature, uh, evidence suggests that um, this feature could be uh, attacked and escaped by attackers from time to time. Okay, let's get this started. Uh, so first, a little bit background on me. Uh, my name is Samira Isalu. Uh, I am a security researcher with the Advanced Threat Analytics team uh, of the Centaur. Um, last year, I graduated from the Master of Cybersecurity and Threat Intelligence uh, program uh, from the University of Guelph. Um, I did my final project with the ATA team and they hired me as a result of that collaboration. Um, and the agenda for today is first uh, a bit of introduction about where do I work and what my company does. Uh, then I want to talk about the Master of Cybersecurity and Threat Intelligence program. Um, uh, after that, um, I want to continue my presentation uh, with the browser sandboxes and how they work. Um, I continue uh, with uh, explaining the architecture of uh, some different browser sandboxes. And um, then I briefly discuss about the ways that attackers can escape from them. And to finish, I'll talk about the well-known incidents uh, that had, had, had happened. Let me tell you a little about our company. Mm. East Entire uh, headquartered in Canada uh, we are a multinational company and operate SOCs across North America and Europe. We are online 24 seven, right, right now we are uh, protecting about $6 trillion in assets. And um, our year over year growth is about 90%. Just in 2019, we've seen over 2.6 billion indicators of suspicious events and things that have had to be investigated by our SOC and our security researchers. So as the ATA team, um, we operate as East Entire's advanced threat research and uh, development branch. We are very focused on complex cybersecurity. 
Um, we are concerned with CTPs, which are the most complex techniques that adversaries try to use. As a woman working in this field, um, I'm grateful for being in this company, especially with the ATA team. Uh, I'm working with friendly and supportive colleagues. I mentioned before that I graduated from the MCTI program, Master of Cybersecurity and Threat Intelligence from University of Guelph. This program is a full and part-time course-based program. Um, mine was uh, full-time and I completed it within 12 months for three semesters. Um, I have learned new things literally every minute throughout my education in this program. From outstanding faculty at the University of Gulf. Um, I gained a hands-on and real world experience since the courses they provide is a wide range of different topics in cybersecurity. There are nine scholarships for $5,000 available to students. Five of the scholarships are awarded solely uh, to top five female students to encourage more women to get into the cybersecurity. In this picture, you're seeing me accepting Eastern Tires scholarship, which was one of those scholarships uh, for top female students. <clears throat> students can also apply to do a project with uh, industry partners where they are paid $10,000 for four months during the internships. Um, company logos here in this picture is a small list of some companies that this year's students are interning with. So um, first, let me start this topic uh, with the simple question of what a browser really is. Um, it's a software client that is designed for downloading and executing content and code that uh, was written by people you don't know and that you definitely don't trust. Sandboxing is a feature uh, that is built in the browsers to raise security. Like the normal sandbox, which is a box full of sand for kids to play with, um, and prevent the spread of sand, uh, the job of the sandbox is to make sure all that untrusted code um, runs in a separate environment that can't harm any parts of the system that are outside of sandbox. We have to consider that even well-known websites might host malicious code. So how sandboxing works? In a browser, each website um, you open is an independent and distinct process. With sandboxing, uh, browsers uh, prepare a protection mechanism for each process by limiting its permissions and authorities. So uh, if one process is at risk by a malicious code, other processes within that browser and even the computer itself um, will be protected against that risk. Plugins also sandbox within a browser to protect users. Imagine you're watching a video online or even uh, opening some PDF documents within your browser. These are different type, types of plugins. 
which if you don't keep them up to date might have vulnerabilities and be potential to hacked. Sandboxing uh, for plugins will protect you by keeping them up to date. Okay, first of all, I want to point that most of the popular browsers such as Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Opera, and Brave are Chromium based. Chromium is uh, Google's open source browser project. So uh, the architecture of them is almost same. As you can see in this diagram, um, sandboxing in Chrome consists of two different processes. One uh, is the broker process, and the other one is the target process that can be one or more. The broker is a browser process which by using OS level sandboxing uh, controls target processes activities and their privileges. Broker um, includes the Sandbox Interception Manager, IPC service, policy engine service, and defined policies for each target per process. IPC stands for Interprocess Communication. Uh, in sandboxing, IPC is used to send messages, requests for privileges and forward Windows API calls from target processes uh, to the broker. Um, API calls could be requesting access to the local files um, and the other resources like microphone, camera, etc. For answering um, those requests will be evaluated by the policy, and if it is eligible, the result will send back to the target by the same IPC. The interception manager uh, here packs the result of API calls for sending back them to the target process. A target process, which is the renderer, contains the code that will run in the sandbox, uh, the sandbox IPC client, policy engine client, and interception. <laughs> Interception's job here is the same as the one in the broker, and it manages um, to sending API calls to the broker. Before um, sending any calls to the broker, they will be evaluated by the policy in the target processes as well. I want to uh, show you something here. If uh, you want to get right off sandbox on your um, Chrome, you just need to type dash dash no dash sandbox in front of the command line uh, for opening your curl. Um, security sandboxing for Firefox. Um, it works with parent child process architecture. Um, the parent uh, in this architecture is the browser engine and controls uh, the access to the resources uh, on the browser and the computer. Um, similar to Chrome architecture, uh, Firefox uses IPC uh, for communication between parent and the child processes. IPC here could be um, different IPDL protocols, message manager, etc. IPDL is uh, short for IPC protocol definition language and is a Mozilla specific language for sending messages between processes. 
um, each child process or content process, uh, which is in a different sandbox, contains the untrusted code that will be run in the sandbox and could be a malicious code. The child process sends a request to the parent uh, for running a code via IPC or requesting for resources. Parent process will check the privileges of that child and respond to the request with the same IPC. Safari. Mm, like the other apps on the Mac OS, uh, Safari uses the app sandbox for its security. So basically, uh, the app sandbox does the protection by limiting each app's uh, access to other resources on the system or even on the user data. App Sandbox enables users to define the access to the resources and data for each app themselves. And it does this by familiar and simple interactions with the OS, uh, such as opening dialog boxes and asking from users. Um, when an app tries to access for any resource, which is not normal for that app to do so, and is not in its pro, uh, project definition, uh, it will be rejected by the system. And uh, one thing that is really interesting about Safari is um, in comparison with other browsers, um, Chrome and Firefox, um, uh, in Chrome and Firefox, uh, target processes and plugins are sandbox, uh, not the broker and main process. But in Safari, main process is sandbox as well. What is a sandbox escape? Um, it is an exploit that enables attackers to run a malicious code and execute it uh, within a browser, but outside of the sandbox isolated area. But how? Um, here are now some ways to do this. Um, in the security model of the Chrome browser, um, it relies on the sandbox processes to protect itself from attacks uh, such as remote script execution or cross-site scripting or XSS attacks, etc. Mm, as said before, uh, the sandbox is working based on the OS sandboxing. And the broker process runs without a uh, sandbox. Having said that, two types of vulnerabilities can be considered. First is OS sandboxing vulnerability, which can uh, affect the Chrome sandboxing mechanism and is out of control for, uh, of the Chrome development team. And the second one is Chrome vulnerability in managing the sandboxes. In this kind of attack for being successful, uh, the attackers need to first run a malicious code within the sandboxing area. And uh, say, um, second action uh, that he needs to do is find bugs to be able to escape from the sandbox. I will address these two types of attacks with uh, real world incidents. Um, first incident, all the mentioned browsers um, have relied on the OS facilities for um, process sandboxing. It means um, every change or weakness in these mechanisms is 
out of control uh, for the browser developer team. Uh, in one case in Windows 10 1903, one vulnerability has been detected that can be exploited to bypassing the Windows token security feature. Therefore, the attacker was able to escape uh, from sandboxing. This vulnerability was fixed in April 2020. Um, the second incident, um, in the previous slide, I mentioned that for the uh, sandbox escape, uh, the attacker needs to first um, run a malicious code in the target process. And second, he or she needs to find a bug to make them capable of escaping from the sandbox. In this bug, uh, the attacker benefits from Mojo and use after free or UIF vulnerability to successfully escape from the sandbox. Mojo here is the main IPC mechanism, uh, which is for communicating between processes. And uh, UIF is a vulnerability that occurs in the case of using dynamic me memory incorrectly. If uh, you're really into uh, technical aspects of this issue, I would suggest you to take a look at the theory.io website. You'll find it interesting. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, let me give you a summary of what I've been talking about over the last couple of minutes. Um, so sandboxing generally is a secure way to protect your computer and your data from compromise. I've talked about OS sandboxing as well, which I want to point that all the well-known operating systems uh, have their own sandboxing mechanism. Then I've talked about three different browser sandboxes and the way that they try to um, secure the, their users. Finally, I've addressed two types of uh, ways to bypass sandboxes. These are the references that I've used for today's presentation. And that is the browser sandboxes. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate that you took the time to be here and listen to my presentation. Thank you, Samira. Um, amazing, it's very interesting. Um, Actually, we don't have any questions yet. Please, uh, please ask your questions uh, in the chat. We are monitoring that. In the meantime, um, so I understand that you are a researcher and you use browser sandboxing for testing different features, right? Or maybe you can explain a little bit uh, more. How are you using it like on a daily basis or a part of your research a little bit? Um, actually, um, now we are, uh, mostly on cloud environment. And we're using um, most of the cloud features such as sandboxing that they present us. And um, it's we have to consider these vulnerabilities and uh, we have to be safe from them, from the vulnerabilities and yeah. Interesting. Uh, Nitika, did you have a question for Samira? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, so Samira, well, thank you for the great presentation. And then threat intelligence has always been an area of interest for me as well. Uh, so I was wondering, like, if someone has to start their career in threat intelligence, how should they go about it? Um, I would say um, if someone to start any job, any career, not specifically cybersecurity, um, they have, they have to love the job, they need to love the um, purpose of that uh, job, actually. 
And um, if you love something, then you would do anything that it needs to do. And uh, overcoming any obstacles at, other than that uh, would be easy. And, uh, but from the technical view, um, I would suggest um, programming and computer and network would be uh, most uh, important skills that um, anyone who wants to do this career um, have, have has to have. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think you cannot be successful in security if you don't love what you do because you always need to um, read, learn, do research and be really enthusiastic and believe in it, right? <laughs> in order to some, uh, succeed. So how did you start your career in cybersecurity? Yeah, it's a long story actually. Um, before I came to Canada, I had been working as a, a software architecture and developer uh, in a reputable company in my home country and for almost 10 years. And um, I was familiar with cybersecurity uh, as much as um, a developer needs to know, and that's it. But um, our company uh, um, has uh, CTF competitions uh, and uh, I um, compete with my colleagues once. I uh, actually enjoyed a lot that session and um, I admired so much our security uh, team in our company as well. So I said that this is the thing that I want to go for it. Uh, I started searching uh, about cybersecurity programs, especially in Canada. Uh, I uh, saw the uh, advertisements of the MCTI uh, program and I watched a video um, that Ali was uh, speaking about Ali is a director of the MCTI and uh, he was uh, speaking about the program and the cybersecurity. And uh, I decided to take this program and apply for it. Um, I started reading English, studying English. And uh, now after two years, I'm here in front of you as a security researcher uh, in a reputable company, but now in Canada. Very interesting. And I absolutely love uh, such um, events like CTF. Uh, Leading Cyber Ladies have annual CTF. Uh, we just had one in, um, in February. And definitely wherever um, someone has uh, opportunity to do that, um, take, definitely take that opportunity. You'll learn so much of it. In the meantime, I see a couple questions right now from the audience. So Samira, I will uh, read them to you. Uh, Jordan has a question. Could you comment on some tips to avoid an application escaping from the sandbox? What are some tools or techniques to detect any leaks? Um, for the, could you please the, the, tell <laughs> the second part of the question? Yes, the second part is what are the, some tools or techniques to detect any leaks? Oh, uh, you can, uh, um, absolutely search for um, techniques that can um, um, that can detect uh, these kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, as I said before, uh, one side was a theory that I owe that um, uh, it's mentioned that uh, one vulnerability that has happened about um, about uh, escaping from sandbox for um, for the Microsoft Edge and Chromium. And um, uh, it will explain about it uh, really uh, uh, with a lot of details and um, you can learn a lot of, uh, during that session. But uh, this is not something that I can say now 
Eba. Okay. Um, all right. I have a couple more questions here right now. I think the audience is just warming up <laughs> for Q&A. Um, Ashish is asking, I'm getting into QA and testing in Windows environments. Are there any sandbox applications you would recommend besides the default ones like Chrome? Uh, for the browsers? Um, yeah, sandbox applications um, besides the ones that are like Chrome, I guess, for the browsers. Um, uh, as I said in the presentation, sandbox is a feature that is built in the uh, OS as well. And um, if um, uh, you want to run something, the OS is the first option that comes out and you can uh, use, for example, Windows, uh, uh, for Windows sandboxing um, for before you using uh, the browser sandboxes. And as I said before, um, you can use, um, um, uh, the uh, AWS uh, sandbox as well. Okay, thank you. Another question is from Janet. So you mentioned uh, that it's a good skill to have some programming um, uh, knowledge, right, or coding. And Janet is asking, is there a specific programming language that is mostly used by threat researchers? Um, I'm using more Python and I use it really handy because um, nowadays it's really well known and you can uh, use a lot of features uh, within the uh, Python as well. And um, yeah, uh, I would suggest Python is the most popular one. I see, yeah, I, I heard that too. <laughs> So um, when you learn about cybersecurity, um, uh, Samira, what resources do you usually like to go to? Um, um, <laughs> when I was uh, um, studying during the program, um, training videos and watching videos from YouTube was the most amazing uh, for me uh, because uh, um, but I was uh, very new to the uh, subject. Uh, so w watching uh, videos uh, not only helped me to um, finding something that I was searching for, but also learning a lot of details uh, from that uh, video. And every um, details uh, from that video, from videos, was really pr precious to me. Uh, but um, now I prefer reading more. Mm, to be honest, I'm a still big fan of watching videos from video uh, from YouTube, uh, but reading most m more convenient nowadays because uh, when I was searching for something in throughout documents, I can find it uh, immediately rather than watching video whole and just uh, finding some detail in middle of a video. And yeah. Yeah, I think there are so many resources right now. Uh, there is, isn't a single one, right? That you can take and um, just say, do this and you will be successful, right? Or you will learn more. Um, I find myself as well, it's, it's a variety of different things that you can pick from different ways to yeah. continue learning. Um, Nitika, do you have anything from your side? Uh, yeah, there is uh, one more question from Jordan. Uh, so Samira, in your opinion, uh, do access control systems important when establishing a sandbox? Absolutely. Uh, um, as I said, in for the sandboxing in Safari, uh, it's really important uh, when it comes to Apple per, uh, point of view for security. Uh, it's always um, um, uh, taking um, users 
uh, opinion about uh, giving access to some sort of uh, documents on your system or um, some sort of, um, uh, for example, your camera. It, these are all the different accesses that is really important uh, and you have to uh, take attention on these. Okay, thank you. And there's another question from Ali. Uh, while not ideal, uh, isn't, isn't it safer to just run isolated virtual machines for testing rather than within the sa sandbox itself? Um, I would suggest that uh, what I personally do, uh, VMware is, um, is when you um, uh, um, uh, taking access from VM for, for, for the other resources on your computer is, is safe and you can do whatever you want on your VMware and uh, your computer could be safe. And that's really convenient to me to, rather than just using Sandbox. But absolutely Sandbox could be um, uh, safe too, but I said that it has many vulnerabilities and just taking VM could be uh, more safe in this point. Yeah, that makes sense. Very interesting. Um, it's um, it's really uh, exciting, though, because it's really interesting. Um, you know, why would you work through um, sandboxes, right, uh, in a browser versus uh, VMs? Um, I think also it depends on what uh, you are trying to research, right? What vulnerability you're trying to research. Um, another aspect, I would think, um, it's uh, VMs. Uh, you have to know a little bit more about the setup, make sure the VM is set up securely, right? Or you get um, a paid one and browsers and boxes is more accessible. Would you agree? Is, does it provide more um, like accessibility for anyone who wants to learn in the beginning perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I know there is a slight delay in questions, but uh, we don't have any questions anymore. Um, it was really nice having you, Samira, with us today. And really, um, I enjoyed this discussion. And uh, thank you so much to CyberX for hosting us today again. And Nitika, do you have anything also to say? I just wanted to uh, thank Samira and then, you know, like not a lot of people know about this MCTI program. So it's good for our audience to know about the program and definitely uh, if you're okay, they can reach out to you if they have any questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, thank you so much for today. Uh, and then thank you CyberX for hosting us. It was a pleasure. And then we will uh, come back again in May. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you, Samira. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for inspiring young people <laughs> and ladies around the world. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.